Our unit was designed to protect Saigon. We knew we made noise and they, and they could smell us. The six guys from our unit were separate from the rest of us. You can't put the genie back into the lamp. Well, get down, get down. Father Phil, it's an absolute honour to have you on my my show, and um, I had the pleasure of chatting to your uh, your good friend Alan Cusser the other day. Good, I'm sure he kept you amused. Yeah, he said some great things about you. Well, they were all lies. <laughs> he said um, he said don't lend you any money. <laughs> That's for sure. Mm. Which which part of the states are you in, Father? I'm in New England. I'm in the um, Rhode Island, which is about 34 miles from Boston. Oh, wow. So East Coast. Yes. And you've got French-Canadian history going by the surname. On my father's side, yes. My father's uh, uh, grandparents are from Canada, the French-speaking Canada. And my mother's a French war bride from Paris, France. Wow. Salwar, is that, have I pronounced it correctly? Yes, Salwar. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you are the um, esteemed recipient father of the Silver Star. Yes, yes, thank you, I am. Yeah, and, um, and equally, if not... Um, just as incredible as the work you do for traumatized veterans and, and struggling veterans. Yeah, we've been, it's been a long haul, been a good long haul. Even gone uh, overseas to uh, give conference that we're in the Republic of Georgia in 1989, 1999, which was really, was a really exciting. Yeah, I bet. Um, Father, can you tell us then, um, how did you first get to hear of, of Vietnam? I was drafted in 1969 in March. And because uh, I wasn't going to volunteer, but I wasn't going to run away either. Uh, my father was a World War II veteran, so I didn't want to bring shame to my family. And um, so I was uh, Would you Would you still have joined up now, now, now that you have a, a sort of wider perspective on, on the world? No, because uh, now that I know <clears throat> that war, we should never have been there anyway. Um, but but you know when you're when you're a kid, it just seems you know the thing to do. Um, I didn't know the whole story. Didn't that the story didn't really devolve until many years later. When people get traumatized. <clears throat> it's very difficult to deal with, and it comes back comes back in their dreams. Comes back flashbacks comes back it could be a something that they, a sense of smell that brings them right back to Vietnam you know the mm. smell of nook mom which is that fermented fish sauce um, and um, you go buy a Vietnamese restaurant you get that smell that brings you right back to Vietnam you know? yeah exactly and it was the light infantry brigade that you joined did yeah, you have the 199th Light Infantry Brigade. Um, it was assigned to me. <laughs> I didn't, but it was a great outfit. And it would be a very good outfit. Still friends with many of them. We have reunions. Uh, and when we get together, we don't talk about the war. We just talk about the good times, the brothers together. And uh, the wives get along well together, which is great, you know. Yeah, that's probably the main thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what's it like arriving in country? It, is it similar to what we, we've seen in the Vietnam movies? 
when I first arrived into country, it was uh, quite a shock. First of all, um, you get off the, the plane and uh, the heat just hits you right in the face and the smell of death. It's amazing that the smell of death is all over the country. Um, and you get on these buses with bars on the windows to protect you, to bring you into the, uh, the confound. And uh, I mean, we're just kids. We don't know what's going on. We just kind of, we're just huddling together. And, and uh, it takes a while for us to get adjusted to it. That They send us to a, um, what they call a uh, reassignment camp. Um, where they're going to, that's where they're going to assign you to the different units. <clears throat> we went there by ourselves. We didn't go there by units. So we went there individually and we came home individually, you know? So um, that was the bad part of that war. So you were alone at the beginning and you were alone when you came home. Alone, but with other people, but not with the people you fought with, you see. Yeah, that must have been traumatizing in itself to come home and you guys were taking a lot of unfair criticism. Um, oh, yes. Well, thank God we arrived at night. And uh, so we, um, all the protesters had gone home. So I was very fortunate when I got a, a, my uh, flight home to um, my Los Angeles. See, I was living in L.A. at the time. California. And um, so uh, that was quite a surprise when I went into my parents' house. They, they didn't know exactly when I was coming. So I went and surprised them, you know, and opened the door. And <laughs> my mother nearly had a stroke. <laughs> Being an only child, it was very rough on the parents. Um, my, I remember my father saying uh, not to write to my mother about bad things in Vietnam. Because he said, you know, she almost had a nervous breakdown. And so he said, you can write to me anything you want, but don't write those things to her. So I said, you know, when you're young and stupid, you just write whatever you, comes out of your head, you know. Yeah, well, it's all a new experience for you and such a, a vivid and, and extreme one. Well, it's my first time away from home. You know, I'd never left the house before, you know, it was kind of a homebody and it was interesting. Yeah. I remember my mother when I was in conflict, I served in the Northern Ireland conflict mm. and we had to keep all our details, obviously private in communications. And I remember I was talking to my mother on the phone one time and she said, um, she said, so when are you back? And I said, well, um, if you think of the date of my birthday, then add il 11 days onto that. That's, that's when we're, we're coming home. And she went, oh, you mean September the 15th? <laughs> <laughs> my code my code failed and did you do your beat up training before you went or did you do it in, in the country we did uh, um, more training before at Fort Ord basic and AIT advanced infantry training and that was uh, six weeks each six weeks for the basic six weeks for the um advanced infantry training. Then when we got to Vietnam, they, they uh, spent two more weeks training us uh, with the jungle warfare. Um, so we got training again there before we got to our units. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was quite interesting as well, you know, because uh, they, they, they were able to, up, to give us more updated information and with the, how the war was going. And... Um, but it was quite an interesting experience. Um, there's a lot of it that I don't remember, um, but I remember pretty much everything until 
that ambush that we got involved in. And after that, um, my memory, they call it psychogenic amnesia. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a way of protecting yourself from further harm in the brain and in, in your mental capacities. So you can still function. You can still fight the war. So when I got to my reunions, I didn't remember anything after March 1st, which is the day that I had the, from the Silver Star thing. Because I was there till October of that, that year. So when I get to my reunions, I talk to some of my buddies. I says, they said, oh, we were in another ambush. We were in a couple of other ambushes. Oh, tell me about them, because I don't remember. Was I there? He says, yes, you were there. You know, and um, I said, I hope I didn't do anything stupid. <laughs> You know, but uh, it was incredible. They were telling me, you know, things that I, I did that I don't remember. Uh, but I guess that's that's a way of God telling us, you know, we, we, you don't want to suffer any more pain. So they block off that brain so that you don't remember anything, you know. Um, and to this day, I don't remember anything after March 1st. Um except until I got my job in arrear. I think in my ninth month, they offered it. They were looking for a, a company clerk, somebody I knew how to type. So I said, well, I know how to type. I says, I'll take that job. Um, but, I'm, but let me go on my R&R first. Said, I was going to go to Hong Kong, you know. And he says, oh, no, we need someone now. I says, uh, we'll find someone else. I says, oh, no. I said, fuck the r and I'll, I'll take the job now. Because I knew I'd have that job until I got went home, and it was a good job back in the rear. It was safe. It was safe, and um, I could take care of my guys on the field, and so, um, so, so that part I remember being in the company clerk position because that was pleasant. That was fun. It was it was good, you know. Um, do you, um do you rem remember Adrian Cronauer? Was that was that as big yeah, as mean, it was made out to yeah, be? Yeah, you the mean film? Uh, Good Morning America? Good Morning yeah. Vietnam. Yeah, I remember the voice. I didn't know what his name was, uh, but I remember we used to listen to him all the time. I had my little transistor radio, you know, and uh, we'd listen to his music and his. Uh, mm. Yeah, it was great. You know, it was a little bit of America. You know. Father Phil, do you remember going out on patrol for the first time? Yes, I remember. <laughs> I remember the, when they assigned me to the 199th, they were already out in the field you know, on patrol. So he said, oh, good, I'll stay in the rear until they come home. He said, no, no, we're going to drop you right off uh, with them. I said, well, great. So, so I, they, they dropped me right off where they were, right in the middle of the field. And I remember this one guy came up to me. He was a surfer dude from California. And he came up to me, he says, you got any Kool-Aid? I said, yeah, I got some Kool-Aid. He says, your Kool-Aid or your life? <laughs> I mean, I didn't realize he was joking. I mean, I thought he was serious. So I gave him my Kool-Aid. He said, because they were thirsty and all that, and I had all sorts of supplies in my bag. So, um, so that was my introduction to. to I mean, I was I, the guy scared the shit out of me. <laughs> but I remember another of my, my first patrols. This was um, my squad leader was from Guam, and uh, so he, he had an Oriental look. You know, he looked. Uh, he, he could have passed for a Vietnamese. So I remember one day we were setting up camp and uh, my squad was going out to put out a landmine and another squad was going in, a, in an opposite direction to put out their landmine. So we're walking out there and uh, with, the, with the, the landmine, setting it up. All of a sudden we get, we get receiving rounds. Somebody's shooting at us. So I said to um what was his name? God, I don't remember his name now. But anyway, um, 
I said, you know, they're shooting us. Well, get down, get down. I says, yeah, stupid me. I was still standing up. And it was ended up finding it was our guys shooting at us because they saw my squad leader and they, they thought he was a gook. Mm. And they didn't know that we were going out to set up a landmine. And they, I mean, we were, you know, it was just and one of those crazy things. Nobody got hurt. But boy, did they get, they get lambasted with, you know. Did Jesus. you, Father, did you ever have anyone in, in your patrol it, it injured or killed? Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think before. There was, we had one that we were doing, we were still in the uh, rice fields and walking along the rice path. I was in the second platoon. This was in the first platoon. I remember one guy stepped on a landmine. It was far, far from us. We didn't, I could see him in the distance. He got blown up and the guy behind him uh, got, got hit with shrapnel really bad. That was the first kill. Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember his name. That was when we first in country, so I was still kind of getting used to the people, you know. But um, uh, no, I it, it, it actually we the most time we went out we it, we were didn't re- meet any contact. Um, it was a, it was when we went out for that six months from when I was in, we went in for that big ambush the North Vietnamese were starting to come down and we were fighting with Viet Cong before that and uh, the North Vietnamese were real soldiers they were on their way down to try to take over Saigon our unit was designed to protect Saigon from invasion we our unit was supposed to go and to this, there, was, there was a huge bunker complex, and then, and then North Vietnamese bunker complex. We knew where it was. So we are, it was my platoon, second platoon, and first platoon that was assigned to go out there to destroy it. So the first platoon was leading out the first day, and it was uh, February 28th. Actually, it's about this time of the of the year. And um, one of the guys got killed that day from the first platoon, got hit. So we were, we, figured we were close enough. We decided to take a trail out in the opposite direction because it was getting dark already. It was five o'clock in the afternoon, but triple canopy jungle gets dark very early. So we set out for a couple of clicks, 2,000 meters, set up a, a, a camp, we thought we were going to get attacked that night because they knew where we were. I mean, we, we were not qu- quiet. We, were, we never could travel through a jungle quietly, you know. We knew we made noise, and they, and they could smell us, you know. So, um, but anyway, we, we set up camp. Nobody slept that night. I mean, we, we, we were supposed to put on guard, but we were all so scared. The next morning, we got up. And it was our platoon, my platoon, that was supposed to lead out this time. And um, the captain said, let's go down the same trail. Let's not bother trying to blaze a new trail. Let's go down the same trail. Well, that was a big mistake. We never go down the same trail. And we started out early in the morning at the break of light. And about 15 minutes in, we were... I was in the fourth squad, so I was in the back of my platoon. All of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Started hearing gunfire, rifle shots from all over the, from th- all the di- three distances, from the three directions. And realized that we had walked right into a U shaped ambush. And um, so immediately we're trying to make, make a defensive perimeter. To, to get a defensive line to return fire and we're sh- returning fire. We're firing over each other's heads. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're just making lots of noise. And I was carrying a grenade launcher. I didn't have an M16 and grenade launchers in jungles 
are not terribly useful because you got to aim it at a direction where it doesn't hit a tree so it'll ricochet back to you. <laughs> so you have to shoot it right up at a 45 degree angle. But it makes a lot of noise and it scares them. So after about 15 minutes, I realized that we were separated. For, six guys from our unit were separated from the rest of us. And there was an open clearing. And, we, and they had the radio. They had the, the platoon radio. So we had to bring the, the radio from the first platoon to try to get to touch with them. And they were not responding. So we don't know if the radio got shot up or if they were all killed or what. We weren't receiving any, any messages from them. So we just kept returning fire, but we made sure we weren't firing in a direction of the upper left flank because that's where they were. So I, after, I, I got really angry that none of us were trying to make any efforts to save these guys. And I was saying, if I was out there, I'd want someone to start coming out to help us say, get back to safety. So I knelt down. I said a prayer to God. I said, God, I said, I'm going out there to say, rescue these guys. If you get me out of this mess safe and sound without a scratch, I'll do anything you want. And that's the promise I made to God. I went up to the front line. I told the guys I'm going out there to, to rescue these guys. He says, you're crazy. With an M75, what are you going to do with that? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to go out there. So one guy came up and said, if you're going to go out there, I'll go with you. He had an M16. That was named Herbert Klug from Dayton, Ohio. So we low crawled out. He said, there's a big boulder out there. Let's crawl out to this boulder and use that as a cover. And we'll just blast that whole right flank with everything we've got. I'll shoot those grenades as fast as I can. And he's going to put it on rock and roll, as we call it. Mm -hmm. Full automatic. And we did a good job. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see one, two, three, four guys one by one, making a, a run back to the safety line. We knew that there were two more guys out there because there were six guys. When I didn't see any movement, Herb said, we better make a run back ourselves. They're either dead or they're too injured to, to move. We'll go out and get them after. So on our way back, we low crawled back together, back to our, our line. I made it back safely. I noticed that Herb wasn't with me. I said, where's Herb? He said, he's not, he didn't come back with you. I said, I looked over the berm and he's laying flat on his stomach halfway out. So I go out there and I try to pull him in and I couldn't budge him. He was so heavy. And I said, I later said to myself, that was my first encounter with dead weight. I never knew what dead weight meant mm -hmm. until you try to pull a dead man, you know, by yourself. So a couple of guys came out and we dragged him in, turned him over, and he had received a round in the chin, went out to the top of his head, had ricocheted off the ground and hit him in the chin, went up to the top of his head. Never knew what hit him. Mm. I, the guy said, we need to go out and get these other two guys. I says, okay, but we got to, we got to bring some help. I can't carry anybody by myself. So a couple of guys went out with me. We went back out there and still people were do, covering fire for us. And um, we found a Lieutenant and the point man point man was injured. Um, we carried him back. Come to find out he lost an eye uh, in, that, in that injury. His name was Camrat. And the lieutenant, Terry Bowl, was killed. We carried him back. So we dusted off Herb and, and, the, and the lieutenant and all of the injured. 
I, we had a, our platoon was at 27 people in the platoon. We had only seven people that were not injured in that platoon. Everybody else was dusted off in helicopters. We were there all day. We didn't get out of there till about five in the afternoon. I was one of seven that never got injured, except in the head, <laughs> in the brain. <laughs> and that I believe now and it was God was covering for me. He had protected me. We went back out and we we made an, another camp because it was getting late for the night. And I thought sure that they were going to come and finish us off. We had scattered them. I mean, we the NVA bunker people, they 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 ran off. We the bunkers were empty, but we didn't think they ran that far away. And, we, and I knew we didn't kill all of them. Um, so I thought, sure, they were going to come and finish us off that night. Couldn't wait for the morning to come. So morning came, and we went out a little ways to another landing zone. They dropped off 12 new guys to replace the, some of the guys that we dusted off. They put, us, they put them in our platoon. 12 FNGs, they call them FNGs, fucking new guys. <laughs> they didn't know shit from Shinola. So we had to train them pretty quick. I became a squad leader. I was only a PFC. <laughs> but because I was there for six months, I was the expert in jungle warfare. <laughs> I mean, mm. it was a crazy war. It, Never fought a war again like that. It was crazy. Um, but that's basically the story. Hmm. And uh, it took me 13 years to tell that story because I went into hiding when I came home. Uh, nobody wanted to hear that. Nobody wanted to know I was in Vietnam. You know, it was a, a shameful war. It was a we were called baby killers, all kinds of nasty names. So, yeah, it was a tough time. It was the 60s, the sexual revolution. You know, it was the hippies, peace, love, and all that. And we were going to war. And uh, it was just uh, the opposite, the contrary thing going on. But... It was, took me four years after I, I went back to work. See, when I was drafted, I was working for an insurance company. So I went back to work. They, they had to take you back. If you were drafted out of a, of a job, the job had to take you back. They took me. They liked me anyway. They used to send me care packages and all kinds of stuff. So I went back to work. Four years later is when I remembered that promise. Um, no, actually... Four years later, I read an article in the paper saying that there was a lot of big shortage of, of priests. People, priests were leaving. See, it was Vatican II. You know, the church was changing. A lot of the priests were leaving, the priesthood and all that. <clears throat> so I said, well, geez, that's too bad. I don't know. It's just... So I kept going back to that article. I kept going back to that article. All of a sudden, I felt maybe, maybe I'm being called to the priesthood. I don't know. And... Uh, so I decided to go to the vocation director for the Archdiocese of LA. And uh, in the fall, I ended up enrolling in the seminary. So I went there and I, I said, I hadn't finished college. I had only had one year of college. So I got, I got to finish my college education. Um, and I, but I ended up leaving the seminary um, and not deciding what I want to do. I was crazy mixed up, you know, didn't know what to do with my life. My mother kept saying, will you please decide what you're going to do? Either you're going to leave the house, you're going to leave the house. I turn your bedroom into a sewing room now. <laughs> so, so that's when I went and got an apartment and all that. And then I, my pastor said, you know, if you, if, 
He told me, he says, if God calls you to the priesthood, he never changes his mind. It means that he, he means it. So think about that and pray about it. I said, okay. So what I did is I ended up thinking, I want to move back east where I grew up. And so I wrote to a few orders in the back. La Salette was one of them. Just so happened one of the guys from La Salette was vacationing in California at the time. They wrote to him and sent, set him up to, to inter, interview me. He interviewed me and liked me and said, yeah, I think you have a vocation in the priesthood. I said, okay. So he wrote back to them. He was a former provincial, so he had clout. And within six weeks, I was packing my bags and driving back to join his community. And it was until, um, let me back up a little bit. When I was in the seminary in California, I was in two years. So it was about 1974, four years after I left Vietnam. When I was saying my rosary, and I remembered saying to God how happy I was to be here. And I, I felt that he had called me here. And he told me, I had, that's when I heard him say to me in my prayer, you remember that promise you made to me four years ago? I said, yeah, I do now. I said, I said if you got me out of this mess safe and sound, I'd do everything you wanted. He said, this is what I want for you. And I had never remembered that promise until then. It was really amazing. And it was a confirmation that I was where I was supposed to be. So I never looked back. So I just kept going. And so I ended up getting ordained in 1984 and started my ministry in, uh, on an Indian reservation in California. Stayed there two years. Then they called me back east to be a treasurer and their uh, big shrine. I didn't want to be a treasurer. But that's when I got involved in veterans groups. And then all of a sudden, Vietnam veterans started coming to me, telling me about their problems, about their marriage problems or their problems with memories of Vietnam and all that. So I started counseling them. And because I had a, my degree in theology, also as a degree in pastoral counseling. So it was taking quite a bit of my time. And the community said, that this is good ministry. And so the provincial said, you know, maybe you should think about getting a job at the VA, the Veterans Administration where you could work with veterans full time. So I said, okay, I think I'd like that. So there was an opening for a, a chaplain at the VA. It wasn't full time, it was a, a four days a week. I applied for it and because I was a Vietnam veteran and because I had a silver star, I was put on a priority that they would have to hire me before they hired anybody else. So I got a job right away. And I got a job at, the, at another VA for one day a week at a PTSD center as a spiritual advisor. So I did that for a year. When a full-time position opened up at the VA I was working at, I applied for the full-time position. So I could, because two, full, two part-time positions didn't equal a full-time. So I want to be full-time. So I got the full-time job in Boston. And uh, I stayed there for 27 years. Just retired in 2015. It was during that time that I started that conference, uh, National Conference of Vietnam Veteran Ministers. And we changed it into International Conference of War Veteran Ministers. That's where we invited veterans from England Australia and New Zealand to come. And that's when Martin joined. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we remained uh, together for like 25 years. We kept having retreats and doing that. But then we, you know, Alan guy, I got old. 
a bunch of us got old and we got tired and the Gulf War was happening and people were in the Iraq War was happening. And, and there was a lot of similar groups that were doing spiritual healing for their particular uh, veterans. And so I said to Alan and Jack Day and all this other guy, say, well, there's a lot of organizations that are doing the same kind of work we're doing now for the new veterans. Because we couldn't talk to uh, young veterans as they're coming to us. And so I said, maybe we should think about dissolving. And, you know, Alan was having some health issues. We were all started having health issues. So we decided to just fold up, you know. And, uh, but I kept doing it at the VA until I retired. Now I'm still working full time with veterans in my local community. <clears throat> I'm the chaplain to all of my veterans organizations VFW, American Legion, AMVETS. The disabled American veterans, Vietnam Veterans of America. I'm still a national champion there. For 35 years, I've been the national champion for VVA. Military uh, veterans of foreign wars, um, all of them. And uh, so I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like that. I'm busier now than when I was working. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, but that's basically a story of my life. It's, uh, if you have any questions. So. Wow, I've probably got loads, Father. What, um, what does spirituality mean to you? Well, in my, as I was counseling the guys, very few of them were religious. Most of them had given up religion. See, in my, my generation in the 50s, we all grew up going to church, whether it was a Catholic church or a Protestant church, you know. And um, so when we went to war, many of the guys lost their faith, lost their religion, because they blamed God for bringing them there. They couldn't believe that God would allow such death and destruction mm. to happen. So where is God now? God has abandoned us. You know, they said God is a wall, a wall absent without leave. You know, so when I came home, um, I had to develop a different way of speaking to my veterans because I never lost my faith. I never lost my Catholic faith. That's what kept me through alive going through Vietnam. Uh, and so when we came back, I had to learn new language. I had to say, well. Um, you know, all of us have a soul, and, and our soul is individual, and it's a, it's a, it's the spiritual part of our lives. That it, 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 it's uh, it's it's in, not in the brain; it's not it's in it's in the heart, so to speak. But we all have to learn that we're not like animals; we're different from animals. We have uh, that's what makes us different from animals. We have a soul. We we have emotions. We have feelings of sorrow, of, um, of, of emotional hurt, psychological hurt. Well, you know, those things we can heal. Those things we can talk about. And um, so I would try to introduce, you know, God in different ways without using the name God, you know. And uh, many people developed a spirituality around that, mm -hmm. around the uh, and, and uh, that's when Alan and I decided maybe we he, to develop a retreat that will speak about that and let their stories be their spirituality. Let that be their spirit. And by sharing their stories with other veterans who had similar problems, like when I finally was able to tell my story, it, it, it enabled someone else to tell their story. It freed them up. It, it said that they weren't alone, that they were someone that felt sim had similar feelings, similar reactions to things. Um, and that's where healing takes place. And, uh, it, you know, you never, PTSD never goes away. It'll always be with us. It's like a scar. You know, I, I, I always compare it like a jigsaw puzzle. 
You know, I hate jigsaw puzzles. They are too many pieces and have too much patience to put the, all the pieces together. But if and when you do finish a jigsaw puzzle, it makes a nice picture. But you know what is different about a jigsaw puzzle? You can't get rid of the lines in between. There's always the lines in between mm. to separate the pieces. Those are the scars that we wear, the emotional scars. We'll never get rid of those scars. We don't want to get rid of those scars because those scars are a reminder of where we've been. And that helps us to help heal other people. Mm. So I go by calling ourselves like Henry Nouwen was a Catholic uh, Jesuit. He called us, we're wounded healers. And so I use that theme. We all have, have to become wounded healers to each other. And, uh, and that works. And that works. And, and I was able to work with psychology department at the VA. They were finally at that point opening up the point where they were allowing me to come in there. Because science and religion, they don't mix too well. And they were always very suspicious of me, you know until they heard my story, until they heard the way I was um, talking with the veterans. And they saw that what I was doing was good. So they invited me to some of their groups, their psychological groups. And, uh, and, and it, was, it was good. And that, that's how we, they started opening up to their, uh, oh, what do they call it? Their therapies anyway, mm. to more spirituality type spirituality. And, and they, they developed different kinds. They, they, they go to yoga. They developed yoga, developed all kinds of different kinds of uh, meditations, uh, using meditation for healing. Um, a lot of Eastern types of things, Buddhist type of things. You know, uh, I went to a Buddhist retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh, and that taught me a lot about uh, healing as well. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Thich Nhat Hanh, but he was a Vietnamese monk who was exiled from Vietnam, who gave retreats to Vietnam veterans mm -hmm. and um, for healing. It was a marvelous man. He's, he's just died recently, but he um, it was a great man, wrote several books. But um, anyway, I keep babbling on. Um, <laughs> no, it's, one, it's, it's wonderful, Father. And what's your relationship with Jesus? Oh, I, we're like this, you know. I pray to him every day. I pray for him in the morning. I never lost my faith in Jesus. Uh, he is, uh, I can't wait to meet him. You know, I mean, I'm always prepared to die. Um, I always say, Lord, take me anytime you want. And, uh, but, you know, it's his time, it's his choice. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very religious, you know. Uh, and, uh, but I don't push it to people, you know. They know I am, and I, but I, they, they, I don't push it on anybody. Even my local veterans group, there's only like one that's, that goes to church every Sunday. The others don't. A lot of them are brought up Catholic, but they're not. But, but they, you know, they have their own spirituality. They have their own beliefs. You know, I don't push on anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. They've got to do it on their own. You know, it's uh, if it's something they want. You know, Father, when did you find out that you'd been put forward for the Silver Star? <laughs> It, I came back home, and two years later, they, uh, I got a letter in the mail. This was in uh, living in California still. So. got a letter in the mail saying, oh, we, um, we finally uh, approved your silver star. That was two years later. And we're, uh, we'd like to have you come to Long Beach, and we'll pin it on you. And, of course, I was so bitter against the war bitter against the military. I said to them, says, fuck that. Just mail it to me. I'm not interested in you pinning it on me. So they ended up mailing it to me. 
I got it officially pinned on, though, mm -hmm. when it went back in the reserves. While I was working at the VA, one of my chaplains, the rabbi, was a full colonel in the Army Reserves. And he, for two years, kept after me to join the reserves because they were so short of Catholic priests. And by that time, I was, I was, op op I was like, I was open to the military. I had gotten over that. And um, so I, um, it took me two years for him to convince me, but I had to do it well before I was turned 42, because once you're 42, they don't take people because they're too old. So I, I said, okay, I'll go. So when I, when I got my uh, commission as a first lieutenant, I went, I went to the base. They knew, they knew that I had my silver star. They knew that it was never pinned on officially. They said, we would like to officially pin, uh, pin your silver star on you. I says, okay, I'm ready for that ceremony now. I wasn't then, but I am now. I had my mother with me. My father was deceased. The, the mayor of my town came. A lot of my uh, community people came. And uh, it was a nice little ceremony. Pinned it on. I got my commission. So I served in the reserves for 12 years. The reason I got out is they were going to go to Iraq. And my mother was 84 years old. And I couldn't do that to my mother. To leave her again, she was that would have killed her. So I got a hardship out. Otherwise, I would have stayed the entire 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I got out as a, as a captain. One thing I didn't tell you, I think is important, is the year I started the, the conference, um, War Veterans Conference, 1990, was also the same year that I went back to Vietnam with a group of veterans. The VA had put out a, a, a program, the psychology department, psychiatry department, saying we're, we're, we're organizing a trip back to Vietnam for war veterans to bring you back to your area where you served to see if it would be healing for you. It was a test. And we will have a VA psychiatrist go with you and it will be a therapeutic trip. And you will have uh, sessions every night to debrief. So I signed up for that. And uh, I got approved. I didn't go on the first trip. I was gone for the second trip. I have 12 veterans. All of them were Marines, except for me and a couple of other Army guys. So most of the guys uh, served were in the northern part of South Vietnam. I was in the south. And it was one woman a nurse who had served in, in Chu Lai. So we went back to Vietnam and, uh, oh boy, my mother thought I was crazy. My Vietnam friends at home thought I was crazy. Why are you going back there? You're going you're gonna to crack up. You're going to go nuts, you know, you know. So I said, I got to go back. I really hated Vietnamese people. I needed to be healed. I was a priest. A priest cannot heal. I cannot hate a group of people. And I, I had to figure out a way to fall in love with them again. So I went back in there. Back, back, but the first place we went to was Hanoi, North Vietnam. So went to North Vietnam, got off the plane, and it was soldiers with their pit helmets. Are we running on a tape? No, I'm just looking at my map here just to orientate myself in country, so to speak. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. So I um, got off the plane and still the smell of death from 20 years before. Incredible. 25 years before. And it was really shocking. I mean, you go there. I got, I started having an anxiety attack in the airport at the Hanoi airport. So the, the, the lady came with us, the nurse, she gave me a Valium, half of a Valium. She says, take this half a Valium. Now, give me the whole thing. She says, oh, half will be enough. <laughs> she says, yes, nurse. So I took it. 
And it calmed me down for a little bit, you know. Went, at, settled in our hotel, went to our first restaurant and uh, eating all kinds of strange food. And I broke down at the table. I started crying. I said, I don't think I should have been here. I think everybody was right. I think that was, I was wrong to come here. And it's, it's just not going to make, I'm not going to be able to stay. It's a, the trip was for three weeks. And I, I break down the first day. So the psychiatrist, the VA psychiatrist, takes me out onto the balcony and talks to me. And he puts his arm around me. He says, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I'm breaking up. I says, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going crazy. He says, you know something? You're not. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. It's just that you're the first one to do it from this group. You just got to relax and take everything in and we'll talk about it. But you'll be all right. You'll be fine. Um, he calmed me down. Um, and, you know, the next day we started walking through the streets of San Juan. And the first thing that the kids do, there's children all over the place. They see white-skinned people, Caucasians, and they run up to you. They come and they circle, and they're all around you. They're like four or five-year-old kids, seven-year-old kids. And I said to them, I says, oh, my God. And I never liked children to begin with that much, you know, especially a lot of them. They make me nervous. <laughs> so, so anyway... They wanted us, they wanted to touch us. They, they said they, they kept t touching us and all that. And the guys were saying they've never, they don't see white people often, you know, and they don't see white people at all. And so you're, you're different to them. They're not there to harm you. He said, okay. So that night we talked about it. It says, you know, I remember this, the passage in this gospel where Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not harm the least one of these children. And I said to them, I says, yeah, you know, it's the children that are trying to heal me. It's okay. I can love them. And, uh, and, it's, and it was through the children's eyes that I was able to start looking into the eyes of the men my age, the Vietnamese men, because I kept thinking, you could have been on an NVA or Viet Cong fighting against me, you know. And uh, it was, and we did meet former soldiers, you know. And uh, that was the intent to talk to each other and uh, and to, to heal. So it was. Uh, then I moved on to um, my area. And uh, I'm going to skip until the end, the day before we go back. Mm -hmm. I celebrated Mass at the cathedral in Saigon. I asked the priest, the pastor, if it'd be okay. See, he knew, he, he didn't know English, and I didn't know Vietnamese. The only common language we had together was French. So I spoke to him in French, and I asked him if I could come celebrate the Mass with him. And he said, yes, come back tomorrow. And it was a daily mass. It wasn't a Sunday mass. But daily mass, the church was full of people, Vietnamese people. And they sing everything. And it was beautiful. And he asked me to speak to them at the homily. I spoke to them and I said to them in French, I said, 20 years ago, I was here fighting, fighting people who looked like you. And here I am 20 years later, here to ask forgiveness for my participation in the war and for you to forgive me and for me to fig fig forgive you for the hurt that you've caused us and me. And, uh, and it was very healing for me to say that. After communion, I sat down and I looked at this and I said, 
Wow. Who would have thought 20 years ago I was fighting in a war against these people that I would be here as a priest celebrating a massive reconciliation of forgiveness? It was so powerful. When I went back to the hotel, one of the guys that was at that mass came to, up to me with his daughter. And he spoke to me in French. And he said, Father, can you help me? I said, I don't know. We're leaving tomorrow to go back to the United States. What can it do for you? He says, I adopted two Amerasian children. You know what Amerasians are, right? Uh, American, American Asian? Yes. Where uh, Americans uh, beget, a, uh, a, they get pregnant with their Vietnamese women. Mm. And they become an, an outcast to the Vietnamese people, the Amerasians. So he adopted two Amerasian children. And he had two children of his own. And he asked me if he had, if I could help him come back to the United States on the Amoration program. See, if, if, if they had Amoration children, they were first priority to come back to the United States. However, not the entire family, just the Amorations. So I do do what I can. So I got his name, his information, and all that. When I went back to the United States, I wrote back to the... Uh, ODP play people, the um, over uh, de it's a departure program from Bangkok. They were the ones that were doing processing. I can't remember what it's called. I'm get my age. I don't remember a lot of things. That's okay. So so anyway, I wrote them back and see if that that family was in the list. They said yes. This family is on is at the bottom of the list. I said, I would be willing to sponsor them. I don't know what it means to sponsor them, but I would be happy to sponsor them. He says, wonderful. They wrote back. They were immediately put to the top of the list. All they were doing was waiting for someone who would adopt them. Okay, I, I, I sponsored them. They went to Hawaii for six weeks to a re-education camp to learn English, to learn quite a few things about the culture and whatever, history of the United States. And then they came, at the time, six weeks later, they came to Boston. So I had a bunch of my Vietnamese, Viet, Vietnam friends come to greet them at the airport with me. And we had the press there. We wanted to make a, 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 you know, an interesting story. And I had gotten an apartment for them in Attleboro, um, really cheap. And, uh, so we got them, we greeted them, we greeted them with flowers, we all that. It was a wonderful experience. And um, they had their four children, their four children were adults, and uh, they're still living with them right now. <laughs> they stayed about uh, six months there. Then they disappeared. They found that they had relatives in Santa Ana, California. Santa Ana, California is called Little Saigon because it's, that's where, it's like Chinatown in Los Angeles or New York. So they wanted to move back there, but they didn't want to tell me because they thought I would stop them because they were, I had adopted them. I wouldn't have done that. But they ended up saving money, and they flew back there. And it was a little while later when they contacted me. And they apologized for leaving without telling me, but they were afraid that I would stop them. I said, of course not. So I was happy for them. Now they're all become citizens. And when my mother died in Boston, I flew her body back to California to be buried with my father at the cemetery, the veteran cemetery. They, the whole family, came to the graveside for the ceremony. To, to be with me, because they call me Papa. Then they brought me to their house for dinner that night. So they still write to me every Father's Day. They send me Happy Father's Day and all that. So I, it was an interesting story. Uh, 
So I've got a family that I adopted. It that was part of my healing. Yeah. Yeah, part of my healing. Uh, I love the Vietnamese. I love Vietnamese food now. Uh, mm -hmm. So It seems crazy to think that you've kind of come through the years with your story. And then, of course, the people that didn't come back, or at least they didn't come back alive there, it seems almost crazy to think their families have had to continue too, and they're, they're out there somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. there's that, there's been that gap in their lives. It's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, in May, we're going to be dedicating a Gold Star Families Memorial, finally, in our cemetery. We don't call them Gold Star Mothers anymore. We call them Gold Star Families because it affects the entire family, mothers, fathers, sisters, sons and daughters, when someone is killed in war or missing in action or a prisoner of war. And we're still receiving the remains of missing in action from France, from Vietnam, from Korea, as many years later. And that's part of our mission as veterans is to never forget the missing in action and the prisoners of war. In fact, my chapter, my Vietnam Veterans of America chapter is named after James Michael Ray, the only member, the only prisoner of war from my city. And uh, we keep praying for him to be returned, but we know he probably never will. But his brother's Two brothers are all Viet Vietnam veterans, and they belong to my chapter. So it's nice to have their brothers as a presence there, you know. Do you think if people would listen to God, then there'd be an end to war? Yeah, I do. I do. But it's, we're living in a, in a cancel culture now where they're canceling out Christianity uh, and anything that has to do with religion. And uh, it's all um, going for uh, political capitalism, communism. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just very, very difficult. Uh, it's, it's a very tough time right now. And we're in America. We're fighting, Christianity is really fighting to keep a voice, a loud voice. Um, but um, in Europe, Christianity is pretty much dead. Uh, I don't know about the UK, but um, I, I know the European Union, uh, even Italy yeah. um, is, has become very socialist, um, very, uh, you know, even the Vatican, oh, the Vatican has become that one world, that one worldism. Yeah. I trying to make that whole idea of losing everybody's identity, becoming blending into one, and 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 that's just not going to work. Um, we're too different, um, and I I don't know what's going on with that philosophy. You know, mm. I don't know what you guys think about that, but I think. Um Look into the positive, which I think we must. There seems to be a beautiful awakening of a of a different kind. So not your strict religion that we were all brought up with that kind of didn't it kind of didn't fit for us because we probably didn't really understand it. But I think of particularly off the last couple of years, a lot of people seem to be listening to. Uh, I call it the universe, but many people will call it God. Um, getting rid of the noise, the endless noise of capitalism, of consumerism, of politics, mm -hmm. of division, of race, and all, all this stuff that distracts us from realizing that we're supreme human beings, we're, we're a manifestation of something so much bigger and so much so incredible and my experience now is a lot of people are waking up to this and 
I think it's um, I think it's really positive. Yeah. Is that what they call the Great Reset? I think it's the opposite of the Great Reset. I think the Great Reset is the the kind of shenanigans of the globalists, is it not? Oh yeah, Go, you know, yes, you're right. Um, anything that's got the word "great" on, we just is a red flag. <laughs> yeah. You know, was it under Chairman Mao? They had the Great Leap Forward, and oh yeah, yeah. It's not. It's never going to be good. But no, I think it's. Um, funnily enough, it's actually referred to as the Great Awakening. So perhaps that's another flag. But I think people are fed up with the nonsense now. They realize that human beings, we, we just love each other. Mm -hmm. we, we, the division is always created. This false enemy, as you found out, and, um, you know, as I'm, I'm coming to find out, that uh, life's too short for all this hatred. Yeah. And we, yeah. we can't put this on to our children. Um. We can't, but I, I think the narrative now of these, um, I don't know what you call them, psychopathic, sociopathic, mm. uh, they use the Do word elites, but obviously it's not the, the most appropriate word, but I think it's coming to an end. People see, see through it. And once you've seen through it, you can't put the genie back into the lamp. You know, right. it, it's right. out. The truth is out. And the truth will always reign supreme over fear, slavery, and, and control. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have you ever heard of Charlie Ward? Yes, Charlie and I have, have, have been in contact. You know, I've, I've been watching a lot of his um, his uh, podcasts. Very, very good. Very interesting. He's very spiritual. Very spiritual man. Uh, yeah, I think I I get um what 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 I've come to realize in my life is I listen to it all and I think um you have to listen to all the narratives out there to to find which one right to find which one is the truth I would say the truth for you, but I don't think it's individual. I think the, the truth is the truth and it's right. And it's good right. for all of us. Um, I have been greatly led by a chap called John St. Julian. And I would encourage anybody to check out John's uh, YouTube channel. Um, Can you just, uh, when you, and when we finish, uh, send that to me in the, yeah. uh, messenger the contact okay. information i would like to do that yeah and i'm i i learn each week that goes past father i i learn more in that week than i did in my lifetime <laughs> um yeah and, and i love it and and as a parent i feel it's my duty to rise above the mainstream media and 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 not and not let that control my life and create the best life for my child that I, that I possibly can. And I also think it's the definition of being, being a Marine is these are all the qualities that we stood up for, that we believe that, that we were. Yeah. And like, I stand by that and I'm going to be honest, not, I don't see many of my colleagues doing the same no um particularly with respect to uh, if i just say recent narratives um yeah i think people have a hard time understanding do you have the game monopoly in the states it, yeah yeah you probably have your version because obviously in england or in the uk yeah. it's london names right um but when you play that at Christmas, there's most people just play it and they're having fun and they're having a drink and they're cracking open some walnuts or whatever it might be. And there's always one though that takes it so seriously. 
and they've got to end up with all the money and they've got, you know, yeah. a secret stash of cash on their lap. And, and yeah. I think we need to realize that that's a, a good metaphor for the planet or an analogy yeah. is that peop some people are of that nature. And unfortunately, they tend to get into what we would call power, not, not the power that you and I believe in, which is a higher power, but they get into this phony, fake, low-level human type of power. Mm -hmm. And we've got to see through it. You know, we've got to stop being led by the greedy guy that just wants to win the monopoly. Right, right. Um, and I just feel fortunate that I've kind of got to this place in my life and that I have some, you know, I have a relationship with Jesus, um, probably not an, uh, the sort of orthodox one that most people do, but um, I just would always consider him a best friend and, mm -hmm. and also the, the, the epitome of what being a hero is, mm -hmm. you know, that, being prepared to give your life for what is right. Right. And I have a beautiful relationship with the universe or, or, or God. Um, I just know everything's always going to be all right. And I'm so fortunate to have this experience of this, this life in what I call this set of molecules that people refer mm -hmm. to as Chris. And, um, I, I finally got to that place that I kind of always knew through my life it was there, but I never felt like it was for me. I always felt that it was just not achievable for me. But by perseverance, Father, I've got there, and it's wonderful. And mm. I'd encourage everybody everybody to do likewise. Um, Are you involved with anybody that you served with? Have you had, had reunions or anything like that? Or Yeah, we have. We've had several. Um, I organize one every year. Good. It's that's healing. For, yeah, that's yeah. for the Mar Marine Corps in, in general. Mm -hmm. And we've had, I think it's two troop reunions now so the troop i was in training with and um mm. it's kind of interesting you know we all rock up and i've stayed as handsome as i always was because i was probably <laughs> i think i was the most handsome guy in our troop unquestionably and these guys are all really rough looking now you know so yeah. bit of bit of jealousy going on there <laughs> But no, it's, it's incredible. You know, it's the, again, it's the work of a, a great power that's brought us all together. And, and um, we shared something special back then and we, we still share it now. Wonderful. Do you, did you serve in other places besides Northern Ireland? Um, that was the only conflict that I saw. Or, or, okay. um, I, I underwent... Um, Arctic warfare training in, in the north of Norway, which was mm. extremely cold for a, oh, I can imagine. <laughs> a naive 19 year old. It was, it was a lot to, I, I found it quite a lot. Other people take to it easier than I did. Mm. And I was very fortunate. I was on an aircraft carrier for a year. So I was on the Marines detachment. Just, I think there was 12 or 14 of us. We sailed the world. Um, we went to a wonderful nation called the United States, full of incredible people, beautiful people, kind, genuinely kind people. We met our USMC uh, brothers in, in a place called Siganella in Sicily. Oh, yeah. And they took us under their wing and they just spoiled us incredibly. Right. Um, and yeah, that was an incredible year. We saw the pyramids, um, visited the old town in Istanbul, 
we sailed to Barbados one time, which was mm. almost unbelievable. They were paying us for that. Wow, that's great. And um, I was going to ask you, did you uh, know somebody by the name of Mark Orm Ormrod? Yes, Mark. Oh Mark, we, we come from the same city. Yeah, we're friends on Facebook. Um, he's a double amputee. Triple. Oh, triple. That's right. Yeah. 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 yeah he's yes. a courageous man. Yeah, yeah. He recently swam across. Uh, there's a, a channel. The English channel? No, it's a it's a. It's a channel in our city, and it, it's between oh. the mainland and an island that we've got out in the bay. Oh, wow. Um, or out in the harbour, I should say. And it's, it's almost like a mile swim, and he swam that with just one arm, which is... Wow. Um, She's incredible. Yeah, it is. And it's a good um, example to all of us that have suffered whether it be trauma or or, or physically that that life goes on yeah. and we just have to make our peace with the past move on from it and seize the day because it's it's uh it's a great place to be one of the things that i wanted to mention too is and i just touched upon it at the beginning was uh, let me just take a sip here <clears throat> was uh, an opportunity to uh, go to the Tbilisi, Georgia. And uh, it was a conference called Peaceful Caucasus. <clears throat> and the intent was, it was supposed to be a, a healing conference for the Georgian veterans who served in the Soviet military in the war in Afghanistan. And so it was veterans from Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Uzbekistan, and uh, from Russia, attended this conference called pa Peaceful Caucasus. And um, I was able to give a talk uh, about PTSD and spiritual healing. Uh, it was given in English and simultaneously translated into Georgian. And uh, in the book that they published, because it had to be printed out, and they published it in Georgian, English, and Russian. And it was just a, the Georgian people were just so wonderful. And I kept in touch with them for many years later. And one of them was a general. Um, one of them was uh, uh, a lieutenant, a colonel in the, in the army. That was the Soviet army. But none of them were getting benefits. And uh, they were, it was a very sad situation because one of the problems that they were suffering from is they were serving under the Soviet army. So they, the Soviet army didn't, Soviet Union didn't exist anymore. So Moscow had no obligation to pay any pensions or disability to, the, to those veterans who served under them. Mm. And so they were caught in a, in a no zone where, and so many of them are homeless street people. Um, they've got disabilities that they can't, they can't afford to take care of. It's just very, very sad. But um, we've kept in touch over the years. They went back the following year, went to uh, Azerbaijan and got uh, interviewed on one of their radio programs in Baku about my work with the, with the veterans and all that. And uh, so it, it was kind of exciting to meet ve veterans from the former Soviet Union uh, that we've come to uh, really respect and they respect us very much. Uh, the Chechen was the one that, from the Chechen, he was a, a, an amputee above the waist. Um, one leg, he's only had one leg came and boy, was he tough as nails. But it was, it was interesting to meet with all these different people. Mm. Uh, yeah. And we should, before we go, say a big thank you to Martin Webster for putting us in contact, Father. Absolutely. Martin's a great guy. Yeah. yeah. I like my chats with uh, 
with Martin. He's very. You live, in, you live nearby in Cornwall. Yeah, we 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 live fairly close to each other. Oh, I, good. I was um, privileged to go to the premiere of his last his last Pen- movie, The Penitent. Yes. Oh yeah, I haven't seen it yet. It's not over here. Yeah. Oh, you're in for a treat when when you when you get hold of it. I'm sure Martin will send you a copy. Yeah, yeah. Um, spreading the word about about again about trauma. Yes. Yeah. Well, Father, it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, Thank you. Thank yeah. You. I I think um, it's good to keep these, you know, to record these stories for for the future, um, not to let these voices get get forgotten. And the and the message as well. Mm-hmm. So, I'll say goodbye to our friends at home. Massive love to you all. If you could please like and subscribe. And um, Father, yes, what can I say? Uh, absolutely great to meet you. And uh, keep up the and wonderful one day work. We'll meet together. In, in, we'll meet in in person. Yes. Yes, I'm going to be a bit wary because, uh, like Alan said, you might try and borrow that money off me. 